talks called The Democratization of Genius. I think that'll make sense eventually. I didn't come up with this title. Some other dude said, that thing that you just said, that should be called The Democratization of Genius. I'm like, okay, <laughs> sure, I'll put that in a, in a talk. So I'll start kind of early. So I, I was born in Taiwan. I moved over when I was just a couple years old. Uh, my parents, like classic immigrant story, they were working multiple jobs. I was the third kid. And between that, my parents weren't home much. Uh, being the third kid, they didn't really pay that much attention to me. And because of that, I was functionally illiterate until I was seven. And it meant I actually, pretty much every language is a second language to me because up until I was about six or seven, I mostly thought in pictures and numbers. Now, um, fast forward a little bit. Like the first slides actually starts out uh, kind of um, from there. I, I always had this passion for for understanding the, the universe. And it actually led to my first job, which was at age 15, I was an astrophysical researcher studying active galactic nuclei in the infrared. And um, <laughs> this, was, this was actually shortly after I tried to get my real first job, was uh, I tried to get a job at Burger King, and they told me I wasn't qualified. <laughs> but, uh, but after that point, I, I kept on going, and, and I basically, I started out wanting to understand the whole universe, but kind of kept going and uh, pursued the, the path of trying to learn how to make every single thing that was interesting to me. So these are like a couple little snippets. So I studied star forming regions. I put stuff into space. Um, I built some robots that, that won the World Robotics Soccer Competition. I was in a dozen bands, released 20 albums. I created a comic strip that was, had a readership of about 200,000 people about user experience, consulted with a ton of companies, uh, worked on this program called Microsoft Outlook, and a couple other... <laughs> A couple other little things, and after, after I made this, I, I was like, oh, I totally forgot my work in parallel architectures and my medical imaging research and whatever, who cares? So some of that stuff happened. Um, and that keeps on going for a little bit, and, and you know, as I, uh, as I pr progressed in my career, a couple other notches went on there. I became a corporate executive um, running a multi-billion dollar business in 44 countries. I helped to launch a number of the things that are on the the screen over there, and eventually I was the head of product experience for Google, uh, Google X, where we created Google Glass, the self-driving car. Um, we created uh, Project Loon, which is meant to provide, it's a network of balloons that's meant to provide internet to every square inch of the earth. Um, yes, that is a thing, it is happening now. We're gonna do a pilot in, in, in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, that, that's the picture over there, the balloon over there. Um, we created a continuous glucose monitoring contact lens we created a new approach to artificial intelligence called semi-supervised learning. We created a uh, technology that allows you to walk around indoors with a cell phone and automatically create 3D maps of the space that you walk inside of. And a bunch of other stuff uh, that is not announced yet. And that, that was all created with a team starting of just 10 people in about two years. So that was pretty great. We developed some breakthroughs and people would interview me. and. And that, you know, I was called a genius, which I always thought was kind of a weird thing because I didn't spend that much time thinking about that relative to myself. I was like, what's the, even the point of thinking that you're a genius? Um, it just doesn't seem that useful. But then a number of things changed. And actually, I'm, I'm shortening a little bit, but, but really it was a series of things that changed. Um, some of them slow, some of them fast. And a lot of people kind of talk about like having a calling that's drawing them forward the entire time. I didn't really have that feeling at all, actually. Uh, a couple of things that were that that happened were uh, my my girlfriend at the time, now wife, got into this program called the Presidio School of Management, studying sustainable development. And from there, I kind of was like cribbing, like reading her books, like both learning about business because I need to be a corporate executive. I, I don't have an MBA, so I just reading what she had. And uh, also in the process of reading, uh, reading those books, I learned from thinkers like Hunter Levins and Paul Sheldon and the Laszlo's and all that sort of thing about different ways of envisioning the planet to make a more sustainable planet. And this was kind of like a silent passion of mine, I suppose, but I, I didn't really do that much with it outside of a couple kind of side projects. And then a more significant thing changed, which was I was an up and coming executive. I, um, you know, my brain is like pretty good. I can make stuff with it, so that's good. But like, I, I almost treated my body as if I was like a brain on a stick. So I didn't take my, I didn't take care, very good care of my body. And like, I was internalizing all this stress. So I would chew on ice. Anyone that chews on ice, it'll ruin your teeth, so don't do that. Um, and like all these other things that re were really just ways of, of dealing with stress. 
And this all kind of culminated when I was 29 years old. Um, I, I had a burst in my lower GI tract and I lost 40% of my blood in 30 minutes. And they just got me to the hospital in time. Actually, because it was internal bleeding, they couldn't actually even tell what was happening. But as soon as they figured it out, they're like, holy crap, we got, we got to go all out. So they went all out and they actually, uh, in order to save me, they had to put in four simultaneous blood transfusions. And even that wasn't enough, like I kept bleeding out, so basically an another four was required by the, by the end of the night. And I learned a, a couple different things I learned the next day. Well, the nurse told me, number one, was that I was about one minute away, maybe two minutes away from irreversible brain and organ damage. And I actually could feel it. Like I could feel my extremities, like the blood coming away from my extremities and literally my body dying. Because what happens is, is right at the end, your, your blood tries to concentrate around your heart and lungs. That's all that you need to keep going. It'll give up on your brain, it'll give up on your limbs, it'll give up on everything else. But uh, two other things that, that I realized waking up that morning was that, um, number one, that I was only alive because of the generosity of eight people that I will never be able to meet or thank. And then number two, because the human body is mostly liquid, and most of that liquid is blood, plasma, then uh, that morning I woke up and I was more other people than I was myself. And that moment, you know, took several different years to, to go build off of that, but that moment was very critical. Right? It made me come back and rethink everything about what it meant to be a leader, what it meant to create things, what it meant to serve in the world at all. So a lot came out from that. Um, I started working in the developing world, as, uh, as Mia mentioned. I traveled to you know, a couple dozen countries, and you'll see different snippets of it. There's Vietnam and Myanmar and, and, uh, and, and uh, Mexico and Guatemala and what is that? Columbus, Indiana. Very, very strange area. But, um, but you know, it, and what occurred to me was the following, like, you know, toward the end of the time that I was working at Google, you know, if you can afford a self-driving car, you can afford a car. If you can afford a car, you're actually kind of doing pretty awesomely in the grand scheme of the world. And this kind of lingering question was in my head, it's like, who's going to do anything for the two billion people living on less than $2 a day? Because I don't see people jumping out of their seats for that job, right? And like these sorts of things kind of culminating together like led me to go out there and spend my time teaching. Because in addition to creating these crazy ass inventions, as you saw, like not only did we make these inventions, but we made some of the best tools ever in terms of how to solve problems incredibly quickly, how to innovate incredibly quickly, how to go see things in a new light that makes new things possible. So I began to teach because I thought to myself, we have to bring the best tools in the world to people that are working on the most important problems in the world. And through that work, you know, I, I taught and I taught, and uh, you know, about three dozen social entrepreneurs I worked with on things like access to clean water, micronutrients, basic health care, uh, solar electrification, uh, on and on. And I, I tried to hit the entire Copenhagen consensus, if, if people are familiar with that work. And um, it definitely mattered. But there was a point when I was in a pickup truck, bumping through the jungle, like uh, trying to go deliver these solar electric boxes to these, uh, these folks in Guatemalan villages that had never had access to electricity before. And I, you know, I'm not driving because I can't drive in the jungle like that, but my friend Juan is driving. And we have a lot of hours because it takes like five hours to get to this village because you get to the end of the road and you're like, oh, are we here? And then he's like, nope. He makes a left turn right into the jungle and we go a couple more hours. And um, during that process, Juan turned to me and he was like, Tom, maybe it's just too late. Maybe we just have too many people to have a sustainable planet. Like, if we had half as many people in the world, we could somehow pull it together and we'd have enough resources, we'd have enough time, we'd have all that sort of thing, we could make a sustainable planet. And, and I don't know what it was, because I didn't even think about it. Like, immediately as soon as he finished his sentence, I was like, Juan, that's not the problem. Like, 40 years ago, we had half as many people in the world. And if we keep thinking the way that we did back then, and we do right now, even if that happened today, we'd have the same problems in 40 more years. And the problem is not out there, it's in here. And because of that, you know, I learned that the rest of the gaps, there's a lot of gaps on the outside, right? If you can get these boxes to these villagers, it makes a difference. If you can get micronutrients into these people's hands, it makes a difference. And those are the outside gaps. But I realized that, that even that is not enough, and you can't stop the outside, uh, work on the outside gaps, you need to keep going. But, but there's, there's more. 
the, the, the rest of the gaps are on the inside. So as an engineer, you know, I'm always interested in how stuff works. Like the, the reason I was able to do so much stuff while, while I was growing up and as a kid was that constantly I'd be like, how does it work, how does it work, how do I make that work? And same sort of thing, it's like, well, if the rest of the problems are on the inside, how do you go make that work? So you can tell I'm not a marketer because I called the project the psychological antecedents to global prosperity. <laughs> But uh, the shorter way of describing it is we got what we got because we think how we do. And what are the ways that we need to think in order to get a sustainable planet? And the way to, and I also had a deep dedication to practice. I'm a very practical person. Um, some of the things I'm going to talk about sound theoretical, but they, uh, my, my, my mantra is like, don't even begin thinking about theory until it works 10 times in practice in several different contexts. And then, then it might be interesting enough to go put into there. So, Kept, I only worked in practice, and I called the different techniques that started coming out from that practice mental debugs. And I'm going to try to share five of them with you in the next 18 minutes. Here we go. So debug number one, knowing is the enemy of learning. Now, okay, well, knowledge is great, right? Absolutely. Knowledge is a noun. Knowledge is great. And accumulating as much knowledge as you can in life, that's wonderful. But knowing is a verb that you do with your knowledge. And just like any two verbs, like you know, juggling or riding a bike, it's very difficult to do two verbs at once. So knowing, being in the verb of knowing and being in the verb of learning actually is, is quite difficult. And it's worse than that. Like a lot of verbs you can struggle through. Somebody could ride a bike and juggle at the same time. But knowing is the enemy of learning because knowing makes learning impossible. Because this is what happens in the brain when you are in a state of knowing. You have a current sphere of knowledge, and knowing is like a shell. It holds that sphere of knowledge tight. Because you don't want to corrupt what you're trying to go communicate to people in your process of knowing. So because of that, you hold your, your, your sphere of knowledge tight. Learning is the exact opposite process. Learning makes your sphere of knowledge into a permeable membrane. You can, you can let new ideas in. You can allow them to synthesize, so on and so forth. And because of that, you know, and the, 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 the specific chemical is, is uh, is moderated through the hippocampus. Like literally when you're in a state of knowing, the chemical that allows you to learn new things is just stopped, right? Now, what does it look like to be in a state of knowing? I think all of us have seen this before. So a big crisis happens and the very first thing that we do is we bring all the experts on stage. And what experts are paid to do is to be in a state of knowing, right? And the, the, the thing that's tricky about that is there is a good time for knowing. The good time for knowing is when you've already done the thing a hundred times and you just want to do it one more time. If you're opening another McDonald's franchise, it's been done a million times. You don't need to break any rule books in order to go do it. Just do it the millionth and one time. Be in a state of knowing about that's fine. But the place where you want to be a state of learning is any problem that no one has solved yet. Right? So when a big crisis comes and you bring those experts on stage and they're all in a state of knowing, you're doing the exact opposite of what you need. You need to get into a state of learning in order to go solve new problems, to create new possibilities, to do something that hasn't been done a million times before. And I know all of you are doing things that haven't been done a million times before. And because of that, you need to question yourself when you, whenever you get into a state of knowing. So really simple exercise. So, and if you have a piece of uh, paper in front of you, we're going to try to do this in one minute. But just write down any stubborn challenge in your life. I'm actually going to time you. Do, do, do. Do, 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 do. All right, so you got to write down a challenge, and underneath that challenge that you've written down, just jot down you know, three, four things that you know for sure about this challenge. Anything. So anything you're stuck on, write three or four things that you know for sure. And we're going to do this a little bit faster because the time is going a little faster than I expected. But uh, so just jot down a word or two for the, the three or four things. And now stop that and circle any one of those things. And just force yourself for the next 30 seconds to ask the question, what else could I still learn about this? I'm going to give you just 15 more seconds. And we are three, two, one. Great. 
Now what happened there, and I'm not sure if you guys felt it, but when we're, whenever we're stuck on something, whether we're looking at it or not, we are either consciously or unconsciously in a state of knowing about it. The reason that it's stuck is that we are freezing the frame just like this red shell around your sphere of knowledge. And if you can take even a tiny bit of it and ask yourself, what else is there still to learn? Because maybe you're stuck and you're like, I can't ever get this done. There's this person in the other department and he only wants this and it's never going to go through if he only wants that. Right? Well, you're in a state of knowing about it. But if you question for a second, it's like, okay, that's a thing that you believe that you know. What else is there still to learn about it? Then you will actually feel it in your mind. You will feel that your mind starts to become malleable again. You'll start to allow in new information. You'll start to see new possibilities and new patterns. And knowing that knowing is the enemy of learning allows you to get into this kind of, uh, get this understanding of which side you're on and, and have the tools to be able to move over to the side that's going to help you solve your problems the best. Okay, with that, we're just going to keep on going. So, I took this during lunch. People take this little, well, what, what is this? Okay, really simple. This is a fork. And uh, this is what happened in your brain in the last couple seconds. Okay, this is time, and this is how much activity your brain is in. I pull something out of my pocket, and you're like, what is that? So brain activity goes up. As soon as you identify it as a fork, you're like, oh, fork. Brain activity goes to zero. And what happens is you've assigned a noun to it. And every time you assign a noun to anything, actually nouns are just a quick way for you to stop thinking about something. That's actually what happens to your brain. It just immediately goes to zero. You said it was a fork and you were done and you stopped thinking about it. Now, let's say for a second, we, instead of seeing the noun, we said, what are the, C, the collection of verbs that makes this noun possible? And the special phrase that you use to go do that is you ask the question, how is it nuanced? So this is a fork, how is it nuanced? And if I'm asking this question, I would look at it and I'd say, you know, what is it made of? It's made of stainless steel. Not a big deal, but how is that nuanced? Well, stainless steel happens to be, you know, consist of iron, chromium, carbon, these sorts of things. How is that nuanced? Well, it turns out that iron can actually only be produced in supernova explosions. And it's this, the same series of supernova explosions that created the iron atoms in this fork is the same series of supernova uh, explosions that created the iron atom in the middle of every hemoglobin molecule in every blood cell that you have. Right? So that's an interesting set of nuances. Well, how else is this nuanced? Well, where did this fork come from? Where was the fork invented? Well, the fork was invented by the ancient Persians. Eventually, it, uh, it never gained a lot of popularity, but it was used by, by royals during the Byzantine Empire. When the Byzantine Empire fell, a bunch of those folks fled and participated in the Italian Renaissance. And several hundred years later, the, it made its way to France, and the French uh, actually created the modern fork in the process of creating table manners. So that's when they created the salad fork and the dessert fork and all these sorts of forks. And there's manners around those things too. And there's a million other ways that this thing is nuanced. I can ask this question over and over, like where did this material come from? It was mined and then smelted and so on and so forth. And a lot of people have this almost uh, kind of new age phrase where they say, well, everything is connected and they really treat it like this kind of airy fairy thing. But if you ask yourself the question over and over, how is it nuanced? you will see that everything is connected in a literal, obvious way. In just a couple seconds, I took you through how this thing is connected to the same stars that exploded that created us. How this thing is connected to a dozen civilizations that rose and fell in order to create its shape and in order to have it in our hand. The millions of people that are related to the global supply chain that made it possible for it to be in my hand today. And like literally, you can pick anything, the carpet, the screen, like, you know, your clothing. Every one of these things is connected to the entire universe in actually not some kind of mystical way, in an obvious way. An obvious way that if you spent 15 minutes asking how it, it was nuanced, you would see. Now, the title of this debug was Nouns Are Greater Than Verbs. Because, you know, nouns, as, as soon as you see the noun, you stop thinking. But if you start asking, what are the collection of verbs that came together to go make something possible, then not only do you not stop thinking, but you continue to see more and more possibilities in it. Like, couldn't have those civilizations come together in a different way and created a different fork? Absolutely. Couldn't the composition of the Earth ended up different from different star explosions and ended up with a different kind of thing? Maybe we wouldn't use iron. Absolutely. 
Would, wouldn't it be possible to have a different global supply chain that makes forks entirely differently? All these things that become stable and hard become fluid again, and actually, verbs are the reality of the entire universe. Like, nouns are just these temporary containers. This morning I did this, this calculation just to go make this point that it, since the time I've been talking, actually updating the calculation because I talked longer than I thought, so I've been talking for 20 minutes already, and uh, in those 20 minutes, you have breathed in, worth, uh, in terms of air, 3.4% uh, of your body weight in terms of air. And you've exchanged that and released it back to the air. Right? So literally, you are, you are disappearing into the air as you breathe out, and you're pulling in new life as you breathe in. And right now, you're sharing all that with awesomeness, best folks. Awesome. Um, but actually, if you do the math, in, in every breath, there's an atom that had been in Einstein. In every breath, there's an atom that had been in, in Mother Teresa. That's what you're breathing in and out. We are actually these collections of verbs that we happen to call nouns because we, we, we want to stop thinking about it. So we're going to keep on going because there's not that much time. But, uh, but more importantly, beyond you know, applying nouns to things like a fork, we do this with human beings as well. And that's where kind of the greatest crimes happen, right? We, we call people Muslim or Republican or any noun. And as soon as we say that noun, we're done thinking about them. Like, we go down to zero, we go down to 10%, we're not there anymore. And I challenge you guys during this and, and all throughout life to challenge the nouns that you come up with. As soon as that noun comes up, say, hold on a second, just going to think a little bit more about the verbs, I'm going to suspend the assigning of the noun and be present just a little bit longer. Another five minutes instead of five seconds to make the entire difference in, in, in the future of your mind. Okay, debug number three, I've got to speed this up. I call this concept crossing the three gaps. So let's say you've never ridden a bicycle before. Uh, you've never even seen a bicycle before. You're five years old. And then one day you're outside on the street. Uh, back when I was growing up, kids played on the street. And um, now they have play dates and stuff. It's crazy. Um, but it's awesome. Like, uh, parents care more. And, and their kids are not illiterate until they're seven. Um, but, uh, but, you know, somebody rides by on a bicycle where you're playing out on the street. Well, holy crap, you went from, I didn't even know that bicycles exist, to now I am aware that bicycles is X. Holy crap, that's your first contact. And let's say you had that experience and you ran back into the house and you're like, mom and dad, I just saw this crazy thing. It had two wheels and the guy was on it like this. And they're like, oh, that's a bicycle. And, you, and you're like, well, I want to know everything about bicycles. So your parents, being good parents, are like, well, great. Uh, we'll just get you some stuff. So they go to the library, come back with 20 books, and then you got a big stack of books on bicycles. Now, let's say you go and read every single one of those books. Let's say you read every book and you memorize every word. If I now put a bicycle in front of you, how well do you ride? Not at all. And this is actually what we do all the time. We want to have businesses. We want to do something successful. And we read the fuck out of it. Right? <laughs> I read 500 books about this thing. I memorized every page. I knew every freaking mantra. But we're not riding the bicycle. Now, let's say we skip that step of... Uh, of of the knowledge gap. And we said, well, let's just jump right into the practice gap. And instead of the parents going to the library, they're like, hey, you know, I'll just go to, you know, some store and come back with a bicycle. Well, the kid's going to jump on that and immediately, you know, the, the kid is in the practice gap. And like, you know, sure, they're falling off, but after 10, 20 times, they're starting to get the hang of it. After 100 times, they're actually able to ride a bicycle. And this is what the practice of, uh, of getting across the practice gap looks like. And the end of the practice gap is basic competence. At the end of the practice gap, anybody can jump on a bicycle and ride across town. Great, awesome. But this is where things actually start to get really fun because the end of the practice gap is the beginning of the mastery gap. And mastery is a set of infinite wells. Uh, and, and mastery is also the place where human possibility is expanded. And let me make that uh, really obvious, uh, explain it a little bit more. Um, so let's say you know how to ride a bicycle. I think most of the people in the room have ridden one. But by the time you finish the practice gap and you get into the mastery gap, there's a hundred ways of being a master at riding a bicycle. You could be the person that does the craziest BMX tricks ever. You could be the person that does ultra marathons on bicycles. You could be the person that, that can down, you know, uh, mountain bike downhill in any terrain. And there's masters for every one of those disciplines. And the person that does that, that you know, 150th new trick is expanding the possibility of what humanity can do. The person that rides a terrain that no one has ever ridden before has, is expanding the possibility of what humanity can do. And that is what the mastery gap looks like. 
And anybody who's in the master gap, well, number one, they're in flow and they're having fun and all that sort of stuff is amazing. But, um, but they'll tell you that it's, an, that it's an infinite well. So I'm a musician and if I, I know that if I practice guitar every single, every single day for five hours, if you asked me on my very last day of my life you know, about the guitar, I would still tell you there's an infinite amount more to go. Right? And that's the beauty of the mastery gap. So really, a lot of my work around the world has been dragging people out of the knowledge gap into the practice gap. Right? Like we're so comfortable in the knowledge gap. In fact, we, just, we had 20 years of school where, we told us that, where they told us the knowledge gap was the most important thing. Right? If you memorize the answers, you can put them on the test. But we can't ride those bicycles. Right? And it's actually much easier to get into the practice gap directly than it is to, to do the knowledge gap and, and think that it matters. Another concept, staying in the medium. So um, I'm an artist. My wife is a better artist. This is a painting she did of the Marin Headlands at uh, sunset. Sunset's very short, very fast painting. And um, so if you ever watch an oil painter work, well, their medium is oil paint. And they'll go and put a brush stroke down. And if it's not the right color or the thickness is wrong or whatever, they just whip out a palette knife, scrape it out, and then whip up another stroke and do it again. And, that's the process of, that's what it looks like to stay in the medium. Oil paint is your medium, you're staying in it. Now let's say for a second that every time a painter wanted to do a brush stroke on a canvas, instead of uh, being able to just put the brush stroke down, they had to stop and they had to write a specification and they had to run that specification across uh, several different reviews. And at the end of that review process, then it goes to the software development manager. And the software development manager doesn't want to do all that stuff, so they do half of it. And then after they do half of it, it needs to go to QA. And after it gets QA'd, bam, you have a brush stroke. And that's actually how we work on almost everything. But what is, what, is your, what is the likelihood that working like that, you'll ever be able to create a masterpiece? And we do this all the time, right? We think the accoutrement of work is the work itself. But the medium that, that you have as a massage therapist is the massage that you're giving. The, the way that you're changing that person's physiology. The, the medium that you have as an oil painter is oil paint. The medium that you guys have as coaches is that moment of interaction with the, with the person that you're coaching where something is changing deeply and importantly about their life, right? And the closer that you can stay into that medium and not get caught up in all the spreadsheets and all that sort of thing, it can get done at some point, don't worry about it, but it's not the medium. And the more that you stay in the medium, the more that you have the possibility of creating your masterpiece. Okay, last lesson, and we're, then we're going to go wrap up. So, metabolizability is important, more important than truth. Now, um, a lot of people are up here, and they're going to tell you their truths, and I think that's actually awesome. And, and, the, and in society overall, we have this kind of attraction to the people that have like, the most fundamental truths. Oh, this guy's such a great thinker, or this woman is so brilliant, like her truths are so deep. And it reminds me of a story, like I was in second grade, and I had just, uh, I, I knew addition and subtraction, mul uh, multiplication and division, and I had just learned fractions. And I was like pretty good at fractions, and I was like, yeah, man, fractions. And, and after I did a bunch of things with fractions, I was like, I, I, I looked over at my teacher, and I was like, I know all of math. <laughs> and the teacher is like, yeah, okay, sure. And I was like, great. So, now, what happened there, right? In some ways, you could say, well, the teacher lied to, you know, lied to me because, like, after that, I learned, you know, vector calculus and affine geometry and quaternions and some other stuff, right? And um, so there's a little bit more math than, than what she had said. But what she actually taught me at that point was the most metabolizable thing I could get. Like, for a second grader to get a second grade lesson is to help them. Even if you're a PhD thinker in consciousness or a PhD thinker in the field that you're in, for you to go to somebody who's a relative second grader in that field and try to teach your PhD lesson, as, as much as you think that's your truth, it doesn't serve them at all, right? And the, 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 the strength of somebody who's that, who, who's that accomplished at that is to be able to say, okay, I get that kind of you're in second grade right now, so I'm going to give you a third grade lesson. Right? Or if I really want to stretch you, I'll give you a fourth grade lesson. And then if you come back and that's changed your life, then I'm going to give you a sixth grade lesson. And because metabolizability is the thing that really propels people forward. It's the act of service. It's not the act of, of, uh, of allegiance to some sort of ultimate truth that, that nobody can grok. And, um, you know, 
this is true of, of all our work all the time. Like a lot of times we'll compare two teachers too. And it's like, oh, I kind of like that person's teachings, but this person's teachings are way better. And like, because I, I cut that out. And like, you have to understand that those people are all teaching a truth that is metabolizable to a certain audience that really helps them. And because of that, we don't need to fight each other, right? It's wonderful that there's second grade teachers. There's wonderful that there's seventh grade teachers. It's wonderful that there's PhD level teachers. It's amazing. And despite all I know about math, I still use fractions every day, right? So as much as you think you're past those lessons, you're past those lessons because they're now a part of you. They really continue to matter. And because of that, like metabolizability is the thing that you focus on, not, not truth. And metabolizability is about service to the person that's in front of you. So kind of wrapping up uh, some of the debugs that, uh, that I'd seen, and I forgot to say this, but it's like when I got onto the task of making these debugs, I, number one, I started working entirely in paper. And I, I work on these incredibly tiny, uh, I write incredibly tiny, incredibly tiny books. Um, <laughs> But I've collected about 200 debugs that all kind of unlock something about human psychology, the, the, the psychological antecedents to, to global prosperity. And um, you know, today I was able to go share five of them. We're actually gonna have a couple minutes left for, for a, a little bit of back and forth. But let me just kind of close on this thought relative to the ones that I've just taught, which is instead of chasing success or your vision of success, maybe the only question to ask is, how can I love my medium long enough to create my masterpiece? Yeah! <laughs> Thank you. All right. There you are. That's it. There's nothing else to say. Very good. Okay. Thank you. All right. Yay. I'm gonna photograph you.